Um, so uh, this is our second uh, Electricity Markets webinar. I'm Matt Rogatsky with the National Governors Association. Um, excited to be doing this series for our governor's advisors. Um, uh, I had shown this slide in our previous webinar. Um, so in the previous one, we had heard from uh, PJM and the Regulatory Assistance Project. Uh, detailing uh, a timeline and history of uh, just different electricity uh, markets developments. Um, and then we uh, heard from PGM a little bit on their uh, um, work to provide um, electricity service, transmission, uh, grid reliability, um, all the different uh, um, topics that they work on, how they operate capacity markets, real time day ahead, um, and all that uh, exciting work, um, and how they get to work with states. So a big uh, discussion they both had mentioned previously is the um, discussions in uh, incorporating the state um, energy plans into their into their work and the electricity markets. I think that's a big conversation that's happening. Um, and so we are going to be uh, capturing that material as well as our upcoming webinars um, into our website, uh, hosting it on a landing page with a lot of resources for our members. And uh, um, today we're really excited to kind of continue those conversations and really get into the um, federal and state authorities that uh, electricity regulators have. Um, and we're really pleased to have uh, Larry Greenfield, Associate General Counsel from FERC, to discuss the federal perspective and uh, um, his uh, counterpart from the state side, or uh, one of the many states, um, Ted Davis, uh, Associate General Counsel at Maryland's Public Service Commission. Um, we're really excited to see how federal and state uh, authorities intersect, kind of how um, issues come up, how issues are resolved, and just which um, which parts of the electricity sector each kind of uh, interacts with. So um, I think it'll be a really good discussion um, and, and really, uh, uh, yeah, beneficial for our members. So if anyone has questions, you can always type those into the chat bar um, or Q&A function in Zoom. Um, and uh, we will get to a Q&A session uh, after the conclusion of a couple of a uh, couple presentations. So I will uh, open it up for slides um, for Larry, and we can get kicked off uh, right now. So uh, floor is yours. Uh, are you muted? Um, I don't think so. Can you hear? Hey, me? great! I can hear you now. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Reminds me of those commercials. Can you hear me now? Um, so, well, let me thank the National Governors Association for the opportunity to speak to you. I really appreciate it, and I know the Commission does as well. More understanding is certainly better than not understanding each other. Uh, with that in mind, let me add the, the usual caveat that applies whenever a Commission employee speaks in groups like this, and that is the views expressed are the authors which in this case is me, and they don't necessarily reflect the views of the commission, individual commission, or other members of the commission staff. What you're getting is my view of the world, and my view only. And with that, if we can move to the next slide, FERC's jurisdiction under the Federal Power Act. The Federal Power Act is the principal statute by which we regulate the electric industry, and it lays out the bread and butter of commission regulation, and that is regulation of public utility, transmission and interstate commerce, and public utility sales or resale, or sales at wholesale in interstate commerce. Now, let's talk about transmission first. What's key are two phrases in that, in that language. One is interstate commerce, and the other is public utilities. So what is interstate commerce? Because that's where we have authority. Interstate commerce comes in what I have characterized as two flavors, the traveling electrons and the commingled electrons. Traveling electrons are those which cross state lines. That becomes almost definitionally interstate commerce, selling from one state in, or transmitting, I should say, from one state into another. The commingled electrons are a little different. Um, they may not actually leave the state, but they join the interstate stream of commerce. They go up on the interstate transmission grid from the seller to the buyer, even if the seller and buyer are in the same state. Once they're in the stream of commerce, they're considered to be in interstate. 
gate commas. There is, is public adage. What we're talking about is sales of electric energy at wholesale, sales for resale. It's a sale to any person or resale by. So it's at the whole, they resell to you. What it is not is a sale to a customer at retail, to a sale to an end user, to an ultimate consumer. We'll talk about those local distribution in just a minute. But I want to touch upon the other phrase, not interstate commerce. And by the way, I should mention sales at wholesale within the lower 48 are almost by definition considered to be interstate commerce, even where the buyer and the seller are located in the same state because that by statute is viewed as a sale in interstate commerce. But let's talk about public utilities because that's a key phrase, and a key limitation on where jurisdiction of FERC lies. And that is defined statutorily under the Federal Power Act is any person who owns or operates, or it is important, owns or operates facilities subject to the jurisdiction of the commission, that is, it's a person who owns or operates facilities for transmission of electric energy in interstate commerce or for sales at wholesale in interstate commerce. So you don't have to own, you can be just an operator. An you know, investor of utilities can both own and operate subject to FERC jurisdiction. The power marketers are subject to FERC jurisdiction. Regional transmission organizations, independent system operators, People who may not own anything are considered to be in subject of, uh, considered to be public utilities and subject to FERC jurisdiction. And by the way, facilities don't have to be iron and steel, don't have to be concrete. They can be paper facilities. They can be um, contracts. They can be books and records. They can be all kinds of things that are not so, um, so much. Not so so build into that. Um, now there are some exemptions and we're gonna talk about those in just a minute. But let's talk about what's not within our jurisdiction at FERC. If we have jurisdiction over interstate transmission, what the statute says we do not have jurisdiction over is local distribution. Local distribution is carved out, but it is not defined under the statute. So the question is, what is local distribution? What are local distribution facilities? And the commission has generally taken a functional use because the identified in support became most relevant. But there are things like, are the facilities radial in character? Um, is it a situation where power flows into but not out of that particular power flows tend to be unidirectional. Are the facilities of higher voltage or voltage? The lower the voltage, the more likely it is going to be local. So those are some of the factors that would be considered in looking at whether facilities are local distribution or not. Now on the sales side, it's a little bit easier because we're looking at sales at wholesale, sales for resale, which is FERC jurisdictional, versus sales at retail, sales to end users, to ultimate consumers. Those are considered to be state regulated. What also is subject to state regulation is generation. What generation gets built? The choice of solar versus coal versus gas versus wind, that is a state matter. The siting of that generation, the that construction of that generation and separately regulated statutory scheme. But generation itself, the plants themselves, are generally subject to the cost recovery when that cost is being flowed through to resale, wholesale customers, that rate recovery is subject to FERC regulation. The same with transmissions. While we regulate transmission in interstate commerce, we don't regulate whether the facilities are built or not. We don't regulate 
whether the facilities are big or small. We don't regulate where they are or how they were built or how they were physically configured. Those kinds of matters are subject to state regulation as a general rule. And uh, again, cost recovery, rate recovery, that would be subject to FERC regulation because that's an area where we have authority. But the actual facilities themselves, generally we would not regulate because that would be state regulated. What else we do, what else do we not regulate? Environmental matters. Again, there are some exceptions, principally hydroelectric generation, which has its own statutory scheme. But environmental issues we don't get involved with. Again, rate recovery is a little bit different than we would do rate recovery. But the actual environmental conduct of the facility is subject to state or other federal regulation. Safety matters related to safety of linemen, for example, or safety of power plants, those would be considered state matters, not federal. Likewise, governmental utilities are carved out. So a utility, an arm of the US government, like Bonneville or TVA or Western Area Power Administration, they would, as a general matter, not be subject to our regulation under the Federal Power Act. There are, I should add, some regulatory authorities separate and apart. So we do get to touch them at various points along the way, but um, it's nothing that it's part of our bread and butter. More particularly as relevant here, the states, state utilities, including municipal utilities, they would not be subject to federal regulation by this commission. And again, there are some exceptional carve outs here and there, but by and large, um, we do not regulate state utilities, state government utilities, or municipal utilities, because municipals are an arm of the state. Another point to bear in mind is while the focus is on the interstate, within the lower 48, for the most part, everything is interstate. There are some exceptions. Alaska and Hawaii, given their electrical isolation, there is no interstate almost by definition. ERCOT, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas, is a different matter. It is within the lower 48, but for peculiar historical reasons is set up so that by and large, again, there are some exceptions, but by and large is not subject to federal regulation under the Federal Power Act. And Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, which are considered to be states for purposes of the Federal Power Act, they likewise, because of their electrical isolation, are considered to uh, not be involved in interstate commerce. The other point I would make here is distinguishing between sales and purchases. The Federal Power Act is focused on sales. Are the sales just and reasonable? Are the sales of power at wholesale discriminatory or not? Purchases are a different matter. So we could, for example, say a rate that is being charged by a seller at wholesale is just and reasonable or unjust and unreasonable. But the purchase itself, same transaction viewed from the perspective of the purchaser is a little bit different. The purchase, the purchaser, they're subject to state regulation. So even if we say a rate is just and reasonable, state could say that may be so for, but it was imprudent, it was inappropriate for the utility to buy that particular power. You should have bought other power from another seller. That a state can do because it's looking at the purchase side of the transaction, not the sale side of the transaction. And with that, if we can move to the next slide. Perfect, thank you. So I wanna talk about some significant transmission focused FERC orders because transmission is the bedrock for everything pretty much that's happening in the industry these days. It begins in 19, 96, when in Order 888, the Commission mandated open access transmission. The Commission at the time, in the mid 90s, was viewing an industry that was discriminating in the provision of transmission service. They were, utilities were just not providing transmission service to each other or to third party power producers. And when you didn't have transmission, it made it very difficult to have any sort of competitive market because there was no way or little way to move power from the producer, from the generator to the consumer, be it uh, wholesale or retail, 
So the commission said, we're going to address that. Our goal is an open access transmission system, which would make possible true competitive markets. The commission did that through several means. One mean was the so-called functional unbundling, where the commission said, we're not going to require you, Mr. Utility, to sell off assets, but we do want you to separate them internally. And you've got to offer standalone transmission servers. You have to offer this service to more or less all comers. And you can offer generation too, but you've got to do that separately. You've got to keep your operations separate, generation from transmission. So we had functional unbundled, the separation of generation from transmission. And we also required comparability. We said utilities have to treat themselves and others comparably. You couldn't favor one side or the other. The service provided by the utility, the transmission service provided, needed to be under the same rates and terms as any other transmission service, regardless, by and large, regardless of the customer. And the commission did all this, they accomplished all this through what we have called the pro forma transmission tariff. That is, the commission said, here is a transmission tariff, everybody's going to provide service under that tariff. And that will ensure everybody gets the service which is separated from generation, service that is comparable to everybody else's service under the tariff. So we required utilities to file and provide transmission service under a tariff that track, that copied essentially our pro forma open access transmission service. So in the mid 90s, you now had open access transmission and the, the foundation of competitive markets in the electric industry. But of course, that was the world then. And the system you had tomorrow or the day after 888 was going to be the system you planned the day of 888. So you had the plan for the future, and that would give you the system of tomorrow. Uh, so in 2007, we said, you know, there's been a decline in investment in, in uh, transmission. People are just not appropriately planning for the future. So we, we modified the pro forma tariff, which really itself said very little about transmission or about planning, I should say. We said, we're gonna mandate open, transparent planning on both a local and a regional level. And we required people to do that kind of planning. And that was in year 2007. Well, it got better, but it didn't get perfect. In fact, it never gets perfect, but in 2011, we said we took another run at it in our order 1000. In 1000, we said everybody, every public utility has to participate in a regional transmission planning process, producing a regional transmission plan. Uh, and among the things that had to be considered in those plans were state and local public policy requirements. They were factors that needed to be reflected in that planning process. They didn't dictate what the answer was, but they needed to be considered. We required that they be considered in figuring out what the transmission needs were and what the transmission solution could be. And equally important, at that point in time, the commission said, in these regional plans, you need to come up with a way of paying for it. So we said, you've got to come up with an ex ante, almost before the fact, regional cost allocation. Who would pay the costs of changes in improvements to increases in the transmission system. We said the cost should be allocated roughly, and again, roughly, commensurate with the benefits. And the way you do that had to be, had to be transparent. And we were not going to let utilities involuntarily allocate costs to non-beneficiaries. If you didn't benefit from something, you wouldn't have to pay for it. And that is the state of play more or less today, except this past summer, we uh, issued what we call the ANOPA, the Advance Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, that invited comment on further reforms to the transmission system. Now, at this point, I do want to do a little sidebar to note that this is to all directed at FERC jurisdictional public utilities. But ISOs and RTOs are such utilities they are considered to be FERC jurisdictional public utilities. So the rules that I've just been talking about, the approach I've just been taking, that I've been telling you about, 
is equally applicable to ISOs and RTOs. And what ISOs and RTOs do, as distinct from more traditional public utilities, is they provide an independent operation of multiple adjacent system. They're like a super controller almost. They oversee multiple systems and run them as one. So they have a single region-wide transmission reservation system known as OASIS, Open Access Same Time Information System. And they eliminate any sort of pancake rates to go across this multi-utility system. You don't pay each utility along the way. You pay one rate and it gets you across the entire region. And also they provide for congestion management. They dispatch the system, all the generation, regardless of who, all the generation gets dispatched to optimize rates and costs across the system. So the ISOs and RTOs are like super operators. Uh, originally, it was just ISOs. The RTOs were sort of ISOs uh, mul uh, grown up or, or ISOs on steroids almost. And that was Order 2000. Order 2000 said, if you want to transition from an ISO to an RTO, there are some things you got to do and some things you have, to, some touchstones you have to touch and that will get you to our RTO. And that was Order 2000. I think we can pop to the next slide then. So I did mention this advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. So we voted this out this past summer. And we said, you know, after a number of years, about 10 since we did Order 1000, it was time to take another look at regional transmission planning. So we issued this summer um, uh, this advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. And we sought comments on a range of issues, including is particularly relevant to the states, how to consider the state public policy requirements. We've called for comments in mid-October, the first round of comments, and replies at the end of November. So we're, we're just getting started on that process. What we also established at the same time was a, a joint federal state task force uh, that would meet uh, from time to time, consisting of the five FERC commissioners, and 10 state commissioners, two from each Nehruk region. So we had sort of nationwide scope. We would bring people together to talk about transmission issues, including things like, should FERC rules and policies be revised? Are they a hindrance to developing additional transmission? We talk about um, how do you plan most, the best, the ideal, the most optimal transmission system? And, and, and what are the solutions to the problems people are encountering? How do you get new generation interconnected in the best and most efficient way? And what are the solutions to the problems that people are encountering? And, and commissioners, state commissioners have been identified to be on this panel. The first meeting is gonna be November 10th. Uh, so uh, a little more than a month or so, a month or two away from now. And I believe that's gonna be time with the uh, neighborhood meeting, which if I remember correctly, is gonna be in Louisville. Um, the other thing we did was we, we issued a policy statement on state voluntary agreements, where we said, look, if the state wants to get together with another state or with certain utilities to plan out, to agree, here's the way we're gonna do some planning and here's how payment's gonna be allocated or how costs are gonna be allocated. That's not categorically prohibited. You can do that. You have to bring it to us for a look-see, but it's there's no rule, no, no per se bar to states going off on their own and coming to agreement. And those agreements can be between multiple states. They can be multiple states and utilities or indeed one state and utilities. But all kinds of, of agreements may be possible and are not categorically prohibited. So to the extent uh, utilities and states were concerned, we can't go off and on our own come to agreement. We have said in this policy statement, no, that's not true. You can, you can go off and it may well be that we're perfectly comfortable with the agreement. The other thing I would mention, the last piece I would mention is we also are just starting up our Office of Public Participation, um, which had been statutorily authorized for many years. We're finally doing it. And uh, the focus is, you know, this stuff is pretty arcane, to you know, be quite honest. And the focus is trying to encourage to assist members of the public to participate in our proceedings, to give them a better understanding of what, what is going on and how to participate, 
so that they can make their views known. And, and that's something we historically had not done or had not done well before. And along with that, we also appointed uh, a senior counsel for environmental justice and equity, a woman by the name of Montina Cole, whose job it is to integrate environmental justice and equity concerns into this planning process, into the FERC litigation process so that environmental justice and equity concerns are considered, are not left on the cutting room floor. Uh, so those are two other steps we've taken to make the commission make FERC more accessible to the public. Uh, as I say, otherwise it's a pretty arcane process. Um, and with that, I think we can go to the next slide, which is the thank you slide. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. And if you want to get in touch with us, our Office of External Affairs or Office of Public Participation are probably the places to start because they can then refer you to whomever you want to talk about or whatever topic you want to talk about, who the relevant person is, be it electric or gas, oil or hydroelectric, they can get you to the right people. So again, with that, I say thank you very much. Thanks, Larry. Um, that was great. Uh, and yeah, I appreciated hearing about those last few points. I think I might follow up on a couple of those items in the Q&A, but uh, based off a few questions I had. Um, but I will kick it over to Ted uh, quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, just for reference, uh, a few of those uh, talking points that Larry had been going over is included later in the slide deck. Um, uh, but I think spared folks some of the text, so he was able to provide it in a pretty awesome way. So thank you, thank you for that. So we will go from here and hear from Ted next. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to, uh, to speak to the National Governance Association. Uh, thank you for having me and the Maryland Public Service Commission uh, thanks you as well. Um, same caveat, uh, any views I express uh, during this presentation are my own, uh, not those of the commission or any commissioners or staff. Um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, advance the slide if you would. I wanted to um, <clears throat> address a number of issues. We, we have a, a few slides. I'm just going to give you a little flavor of a number of different topics. Um, first of all, what does the Maryland Public Service Commission do? What, are, what is our statutory authority? Uh, we are a restructured state. We're in the minority in the country that we've restructured our electricity markets. Um, and the majority of states in the United States are, are fully regulated still. We'll talk about what that means a little bit. Uh, we'll talk with some specificity about the Maryland 1999 Customer Choice and Competition Act, which deregulated uh, the electricity market in Maryland. Uh, I'd like to then pivot to Maryland policy goals. A lot of those are environmental. Um, many of our, um, our policy goals as a public utility commission involve achieving uh, Maryland legislature objectives for reducing emissions, in particular carbon emissions. Uh, then I'd like to look at some of those landmark uh, FERC orders uh, that uh, Larry Greenfield addressed so well. I'll try not to be redundant, um, but as you can see, um, some of the major ones, PERPA, FERC order 888. Uh, I did want to touch on the MOPR, which has been a source of contention uh, between the states and FERC, order 1000. Uh, and then assuming we have time, I thought um, one of the best series of FERC orders that, uh, that really in my mind uh, epitomizes uh, the cooperativism that should exist between the states and the federal government uh, are the demand response orders FERC issued, uh, orders 719 and 745. So I want to address, address those a little bit. Uh, go ahead. So just a couple things about the Maryland Public Service Commission. We were established in 1910, uh, based in Baltimore City, where I'm talking to you today. Um, we have five commissioners like FERC, uh, appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate to a staggered five-year term. I believe uh, FERC is the same. Um, there are a couple differences there, interestingly. Uh, I understand that, uh, that, that FERC uh, cannot have more than three commissioners from any particular party, Republican or Democrat. Um, Maryland does not have that statutory obligation, but as a matter of practice, it's usually observed anyway. 
Uh, what we are statutorily obligated to do is make sure our, our service territories are represented with commissioners. We have four uh, investor-owned utilities in Maryland, and, um, and we have a, a commissioner usually from at least one of each of those service territories. We have a number of divisions, electricity, energy analysis, engineering. Um, some of those divisions explain other things we do. It's not just electricity and natural gas. We also regulate transportation, telecommunication, water. Um, we have a staff council who um, files in every proceeding that comes before the Maryland Public Service Commission. And, uh, and they have a statutory obligation to complete the record, I think is what the statute says, to make sure that the, the Public Service Commission has testimony and evidence on, on every statutorily required uh, uh, piece of um, you know, it issue that comes before the commission. Uh, Office of General Counsel, OGC, that's where I work. And, uh, and then Office of People's Counsel. I wanted to mention Office of People's Counsel because I think it's, it's uh, particularly relevant to state public utility commissions. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about rate cases, but, uh, but when a utility files a rate case and asks to increase its rates, it usually adds tens of millions of dollars uh, to rate payer uh, bills in the aggregate. And, uh, and, and that's certainly very large with regard to residential rate payers as well. Uh, however, the individual impact on any particular residential rate payer may be very small. It may be a few tens of cents. It may be a couple of dollars for a really high uh, rate case. But in any event, uh, the transaction costs of, uh, of you know, hiring your own attorney to litigate the case before the Public Service Commission would make no sense. So we have a statutorily uh, created agency, the Office of People's Council, to represent ratepayers and make sure those interests are defended. Um, and since we're talking about overlap between uh, states and FERC, uh, those consumer advocates that include the Maryland OPC uh, file frequently before FERC in FERC proceedings as well. They're also advocating for um, just and reasonable wholesale rates on the FERC side. Uh, the next uh, slide, please. Um, so what, uh, a few of the things that the Maryland Commission uh, does regulate, CPCN proceedings, that stands for a Certificate of Public Convenience and Necessity. Um, and that has to do with the siting of power plants and the siting of transmission facilities. Uh, Larry mentioned to you that, um, that interstate transmission is a FERC regulated uh, issue, and, and certainly it is. Uh, that regards the pricing of transmission, but the actual siting uh, once FERC has approved a transmission project, exactly where it's going to go, uh, states have to approve. Um, so there's a little bit of cooperation, uh, or at least dual regulatory authority between the states and the FERC on that particular topic. Um, the exception, uh, hydroelectric generation facilities, those are regulated by FERC as long as the projects are located on navigable waters uh, or occupy public lands uh, or projects that utilize surplus water uh, from a federal dam. Uh, but generally, hydroelectric facilities are regulated by FERC. Otherwise, generally, power plants are regulated by states. Um, and, and so what, is, uh, what does the state look at with regard to CPCN cases? Um, one of the things that we used to uh, look at was need. And that was, you know, state regulators, the, the Maryland PUC would look at whether or not we actually needed the electricity from a, a coal plant or a natural gas plant. And if we found that, that it was not needed, then we would deny the plant. Um, and, and that's something that changed uh, with the 1999 uh, Competition Act. Uh, once we deregulated, the idea was that uh, independent power producers ought to be making that decision, the merchant generators, uh, we'd make a business decision whether or not to build a power plant and uh, the Maryland Public Service Commission would no longer look at need. They would look at other things. Uh, we kept um, you know, a lot of things in the statute that, uh, that the commission is supposed to look at, including economics, the recommendation of uh, counties and local government, uh, impacts on aesthetics, uh, historical sites, uh, air quality, um, water uh, pollution. Uh, and, and some of those things do involve coordinating with not only Maryland state agencies like the Maryland Department of the Environment, but also um, 
federal agencies. Uh, the, the Maryland MDE coordinates with uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, in looking at air quality impacts. Um, for instance, nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide emissions and whatever credits might be necessary to build a, a power plant like a natural gas power plant. Uh, I just wanted to mention transmission lines too. As I said, uh, the states and FERC look at different aspects of the transmission line. Um, but need is, uh, is still within the Maryland statute when, um, when looking at a transmission line, because that would be an unregulated, uh, I'm sorry, not unregulated, uh, a still regulated uh, issue. Um, transmission lines are, are you know, a natural monopoly generally, and, um, and so it makes sense to fully regulate them. Uh, so where are they going to be? Uh, the, the Maryland Public Service Commission has to issue the CPCN for a transmission line to be built. And the reason I wanted to bring up this topic uh, is that transmission lines are frequently uh, built interstate and they resolve regional uh, issues. Uh, it may be that a particular state has a, a specific need uh, for new transmission, but if you have a pass-through state uh, that necessarily needs the, uh, you know, the, the transmission lines through the state to take the generation from state A to uh, the load in state C, then state B might be nothing more than a pass-through and, and find that they don't actually need the transmission line, that that would impose um, injury to the state through aesthetics or land use or whatever, uh, and that the state need element isn't, isn't uh, satisfied. That's something I wanted to, to bring up. It uh, came up in a recent uh, case, TransSource. Uh, the Maryland Public Service Commission approved the CPCN for that case, but it goes up into Pennsylvania uh, and the Pennsylvania PUC denied uh, finding that there, there was no need. Uh, rate cases, I wanted to um, talk about rate cases briefly. Um, generally, when a utility files a rate case, it takes 210 days for the, for the Maryland Public Service Commission to fully address it. That's a statutory deadline. If we don't issue a decision by that time, the uh, utility uh, ostensibly would get the, the rate that it requested uh, rather than any mitigated lesser rate that the commission might find is just and reasonable. Um, distribution is still a natural monopoly. Uh, so even though Maryland is deregulated, uh, what that means is that we have told our generators in Maryland um, that they can be merchant power. They are no longer regulated. We do not set the rates for merchant generation. Uh, but we do still uh, regulate what are called the, the pipes and wires, the distribution utilities that actually take your electricity and distribute it from the transmission lines to end user homes. Uh, and so when I talk about a rate case, that's you know, one of the things that we do. Generally, a rate case involves finding the revenue requirement. What are, uh, what's the total revenue that the electric utility needs to, to safely and adequately run its system? Uh, cost allocation. How do you determine uh, what each customer class imposes in terms of cost on the utility? Uh, and what portion of the total revenue requirement should be imposed on each customer group? Uh, rate design. Um, once you figure out how much each customer class should pay, then the question is, how should they pay? Uh, a lot of interesting issues here, like a, a variable rate per kilowatt hour, so that um, you, know, you would pay more for each kilowatt hour that you use. Conservationists love uh, uh, variable rates because it, it creates an incentive to use less. Um, but other charges include fixed charges. Utilities generally love fixed charges because they say our business is largely fixed. We need uh, our crews, our tree trimming uh, organizations and so forth to go out and those costs are fixed, you know, no matter how many kilowatt hours are used. So our utilities would like, uh, you know, to have a fixed charge of maybe 50, 60% uh, of their rates. Uh, the Maryland Commission hasn't seen it that way, but that's an issue that we, that we um, face. Uh, demand charges, it's largely a question of what is your peak usage? Uh, so the, the commission looks at all of, all of those types of things in a, uh, in a rate case. Um, one last issue I wanted to just uh, touch on in, in rate cases, generally the Maryland commission has used a historic test year. We looked at the total costs that utilities incur over basically the last 12 months 
when we have actual records to demonstrate how much money they spent. And rates for the future are based on those uh, that, that past historic test year. Uh, there's been a lot of complaint from utilities, especially that that creates a regulatory lag, that by the time they get a rate case in and, and a new rate approved, it's already too late because costs have exceeded uh, you know, what they need. Or, yeah, and, and so they're not uh, earning a just and reasonable return. So Maryland, like a lot of other states, has started to look to um, alternative forms of regulation, such as creating a multi-year rate case based on at least partially a uh, future test year. Okay, I think we can go to the next um, slide, please. Just some of the statutes that the, that the commission uh, follows. We regulate public service companies, uh, water utilities, electric utilities, natural gas utilities, et cetera, uh, at, the, at the distribution level, not at the wholesale level like FERC. Um, the duties of the commission to ensure the operation of the utilities in the interest of the public, to promote adequate and economical service. Uh, and then there's a requirement to consider the environment, uh, public safety, the economy of the state, uh, and natural resources and the environment in all of our decisions. Uh, go ahead, thanks. Uh, just touching on the, uh, the four investor-owned utilities that I mentioned, if you look out in the West, uh, Potomac Edison is in the light blue, uh, which is out in you know, rural Western Maryland, and it goes out into Western uh, West Virginia as well. Uh, in the center of the state in the green is Baltimore Gas and Electric, uh, which serves the entire Baltimore metropolitan area where you know, a lot of our, our citizens live in Maryland. Uh, south of BG&E is uh, PEPCO, which serves the, the District of Columbia, as well as DC suburbs like uh, Montgomery and Prince George's County. Uh, and then in the East, you have Delmarva Power and Light uh, in, the, in the blue. And as you can see, that's a, a very unique service territory. It's, uh, it's cut and pasted uh, and intermixed with a cooperative chop tank. Um, and then the, the last cooperative is uh, SMEPA, the Southern Maryland Electric Cooperative uh, in Southern Maryland. Go ahead, please. So I wanted to look at some Maryland policy goals. Uh, one of the uh, biggest Maryland policy goals is, is articulated through our renewable portfolio standard, uh, which requires that a certain amount of um, renewable electricity has to be purchased by uh, each load serving entity and delivered to end use customers. Uh, and that requirement increases each year. Uh, I think the, uh, the Maryland RPS started in 2006 and it ramps up for every year through 2030. Um, this is an area where you know, the, the states and FERC haven't always seen eye to eye. And so I wanted to mention it. Uh, as uh, Larry mentioned, uh, FERC generally does not regulate environmental issues. But uh, as I showed you in the previous slides, the Maryland Public Service Commission, like a lot of state PUCs, has to consider uh, environmental issues and also has to fulfill uh, certain uh, statutes that our General Assembly has passed to, um, you know, to attain a certain uh, level of renewable goals. Uh, and, and generally sort of the, the background idea behind this is that fossil fuels impose negative externalities on society through pollution, adverse health effects, emission of global warming gases, et cetera. Uh, FERC's wholesale markets don't internalize those externalities. And so in a sense, it creates a subsidy. Uh, there's been talk of a carbon tax, but that's not something that's happened. Um, and FERC markets also don't compensate renewable resources for their positive environmental attributes, meaning namely they produce electricity without uh, air emissions. Um, so uh, state, renewable portfolio standards like the Maryland RPS uh, sort of fill that gap. Um, we have uh, basically two tiers in our RPS. Uh, tier one includes uh, solar, wind, qualifying biomass, uh, landfill waste gas uh, like methane, uh, geothermal and ocean if it's there, I think those are vanishingly small, um, and some others. Uh, tier two is hydroelectric power, 
uh, large scale hydroelectric power. And you might ask, well, what's wrong with hydro? Why is that tier two? Why is that that bottom status that's actually getting phased out under the RPS? And the reason is because uh, basically large scale hydro in the Maryland area is, is, is largely completely built. You can't enhance it anymore. You got a lot of additional money through the RPS, but uh, we're not going to incentivize any more large scale hydro. Uh, small hydro is still, um, still qualifies. Uh, and, and then, you know, to talk about how states and the federal government cooperate on some of these issues, I wanted to mention gas. How do, how do we track all of this renewable energy? How do we know that, um, you know, a, a wind resource actually creates uh, one megawatt of uh, renewable energy and that it's not double counted in some other states' RPS? Uh, the answer is through a system called uh, GATS, the Generator Attributes Tracking System, which is run by PJM. So that's uh, that's an area that uh, that states like the Maryland PSC uh, rely heavily on. Uh, the Maryland Clean Energy Jobs Act of 2019. This was the last iteration of um, of the Renewable Portfolio Standard. Our, our General Assembly generally increases these. Uh, requirements every few years. So the current one is by 2030, we need to have 50% of our uh, electricity supplied by uh, renewables. And, uh, and PPRP, an agency of the state of Maryland, Power Plant Research Program of Department of Natural Resources, is required to study achieving 100% renewables by 2040. Um, there are some carve outs, 14.5% uh, of that has to come from solar. Uh, 1.2 gigawatts must come from offshore wind, uh, though there is a, a maximum that uh, you cannot exceed 88 cents per month for residential customers. Uh, and then where can you purchase these recs? Generally, for, for most of them, anywhere within PJM or a control area adjacent to PJM. So it, it's creating basically a regional market that includes at least all of the, the RTO of PJM. Uh, and as I said, areas adjacent to it as well. Solar has an in-state requirement for uh, reasons we might not have time to get to today. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this really, this slide is basically there just to show the, um, the regional nature of uh, Maryland's RPS. You can see that Virginia and Illinois uh, produce more recs for Maryland's RPS than any other state, including Maryland. Uh, and then a number of other states do as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this uh, graph just shows since 2006, the, the, uh, the significant increase in renewable energy credits uh, that Maryland load serving entities are purchasing to meet their RPS goals. Uh, some of them, um, just to, to give you the abbreviations, uh, the yellow is uh, sun, solar, uh, landfill gas, uh, wood uh, waste products, municipal solid waste, black liquor uh, is a, um, an end product uh, of, uh, of paper mills. It's a waste product basically that can be incinerated and used for fuel. Uh, a lot of people push back and said that is a very dirty source of energy. The Maryland General Assembly finally agreed just this last session and removed black liquor from the RPS. Uh, then wind and water resources. Next slide, please. Uh, we've specifically targeted offshore wind. Um, up to 500 megawatts of offshore wind capacity. We have uh, approved two offshore wind um, projects, uh, one by US Wind and one by Skipjack. And uh, as you can see, there's significant job impacts, uh, reduction in carbon emission impacts, and the, the projects are, are also costly. Uh, it, they're, they're paid for basically through what's called an OREC, an offshore, offshore wind renewable energy credit. Uh, and the reason I wanted to get into that is because that involves a subsidy that the states pay for renewable energy, which I said has created some friction with FERC, uh, who sees those types of uh, renewable payments as an out of market uh, subsidy that may interfere with FERC's capacity market. Next slide, please. Uh, for the brevity of time, uh, community solar program, uh, another policy matter to encourage solar development for people who don't actually necessarily own a house. It may be a community, a group of apartment dwellers, 
uh, but a lot of this is targeting brownfield sites, parking lots, industrial areas, and so forth. We found a, a lot of backlash to, um, to placing solar farms on, um, on, uh, on farms, uh, which are seen as pristine and an eyesore. And so this is uh, an effort to, to utilize some other spaces. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Empower Maryland. Uh, generally, this was a goal to reduce uh, per capita energy consumption and per capita peak energy by 15% each by the end of 2015. Ultimately, the commission was able to achieve those goals, uh, reducing uh, consumption by 2,117 megawatts and, uh, and energy consumption by about 5.3 million megawatt hours. So um, that went a long way to, uh, to reducing our need for further power plants. Uh, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Maryland is one of several states, uh, including New York, Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont, uh, that joined Reggie uh, in 2007 is a cap and trade system to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I'm going to ask for next slide. I'm sorry, I cannot. I can't see you guys anymore. Are you still there? Yes, still here. Um, and yeah, maybe if you could wrap it up in the next minute or so. Uh, I think just for a few moments for Q and A, be great. Okay, very good. Um, let's uh, let's advance then a couple slides. Okay. Basically, what I wanted to say in these slides is that Maryland, as a deregulated state, uh, has tried to achieve the goals of, um, of taking its, its, its monopoly investor-owned utilities, which included generation, distribution, and transmission, and, uh, and breaking out the generation portion and allowing that uh, to operate under the free market to make bids, to operate in, uh, in FERC's wholesale auctions competitively. Uh, so that part of, uh, that's, that's really the major part of Maryland's restructuring bill. And generally it has been fairly effective for Maryland in lowering uh, wholesale costs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our goals of restructuring were to lower prices to consumers, increase efficiency through competition, um, additional choice for consumers, more green products, um, more technological innovation. I think we've seen that too. If you, if you look at the price for solar and wind, uh, it has dropped precipitously over the last several years. And, uh, and I think the competition in FERC's wholesale markets has been a big part of that. Uh, next slide, please. A uh, couple of these landmark orders. Next slide, please. Uh, this. Um, this is a map of the, of the seven RTOs in the United States. I'm sorry, if you could go back one, uh, one slide. Um, so PURPA was the first congressional endorsement of competition in the electric power industry, passed in 1978. And it really led to FERC Order 888, uh, which as Larry mentioned, reduced barriers to competition, required open access, non-discriminatory transmission tariffs. And Maryland, just a few years later, after that order, three years later in 1999, restructured our own markets to allow for wholesale competition. Uh, so Maryland was uh, very much in favor of both of those orders. Um, order 2000, the creation of regional transmission organizations furthered those goals uh, by creating independent RTOs uh, that would you know, prevent transmission operators from um, stymieing competition and preventing their transmission lines from being used to deliver low cost power uh, to, to customers. Uh, Maryland supported that as well. Um, FERC Order 1000, Maryland participates uh, in regional transmission planning with its RTO, which is in uh, PJM. If you would uh, Advance two slides, please. We'll show you uh, where PGM is located. Uh, 
So Maryland is one of uh, 13 states, the District of Columbia, that are included in PGM. All right, one more slide, if you would. This was the order I wanted to talk about. Um, demand response is a, uh, is a, is a vital uh, resource that is used in both wholesale capacity and it's ultimately a, a retail product. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time um, on this issue, but, uh, but it was appealed uh, to the uh, DC Court of Appeals um, by generators who said that ultimately FERC lacked authority over demand response resources. Uh, and Maryland uh, teamed up with Pennsylvania and California and, uh, and strongly supported FERC jurisdiction over this vital resource. And, um, and the Supreme Court ultimately uh, agreed with us and agreed that this was you know, a, a perfect example, example of cooperative federalism where the states and the federal government ought to be working together to regulate a product which exists both in the retail markets and wholesale markets. So that's my main point there. You can look at the individual slides for more detail. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, I can uh, uh, hop in with just a question for the end here. Um, I, that was uh, really great backgrounds on so many topics. I know there's a ton to cover here. So I appreciate both of you going over such good content. So um, I guess, yeah, um, my question will be for you guys. Uh, so, um, Larry had mentioned in his remarks um, FERC and, the FERC and Nehru Task Force, uh, thinking about rules uh, needing revision. Um, just uh, uh, so, uh, and then a question I had posed to you earlier. So, um, what or how have FERC orders and legislation evolved through the years as the electricity sector has transitioned? Um, is that kind of coming up in the conversations you're having with Nehru and other states? Um, and what issues and topics do you expect FERC or state utility commissions to take up to accommodate um, uh, transitioning uh, goals such as state setting these renewable portfolio standards or other decarbonization goals? So that's for both folks there. I, if you'd like me to start, um, I, I would say that, um, you know, how, how have they evolved over the years? Uh, you know, FERC, FERC has considered issues of, of carbon tax to help the country meet decarbonization goals, but it's not clear that FERC has statutory authority to issue such a tax. Uh, those types of environmental concerns are generally under the authority of state governments or other federal agencies. Uh, one concern I would have is federal preemption. If FERC does actually issue a carbon tax or provide uh, small subsidies to renewable resources that don't produce air emissions, <laughs> would that mean that more aggressive state programs are federally preempted. Um, so hopefully not. Ideally, I would say what FERC could do in the future would be to act to accommodate state programs by reducing obstacles, uh, such as the minimum offer price rule, which is described a little bit more in detail in my slides in its capacity market. Um, I think PGM has uh, recently filed a proposal to scale back the breadth of its MOPA restrictions. I won't comment on that because it's currently before FERC, but uh, you know, that, that may be an issue that is worth looking at for you know, the Governor's Association. Great, thanks. And Larry, I'll give you the last word today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I will say that um, you know, it's always hard to know what the future looks like. Um, but uh, you know, in the ANOPER, we created an opportunity for people to submit written comments on, on things that they see the future raising issues, they see the future raising. And, and potential solutions. And when you combine that or you look at that in conjunction with the federal state task force, you have a vehicle to uh, engage in face-to-face -face discussions where you can talk about some of these issues. And I wouldn't be surprised if through the ANOPA process, we have multiple technical conferences where again, people get to come and speak to at least FERC and probably others as well about what the future looks like, what the issues are, uh, and, and how do we get there? Um, I will say that the, uh, you know, it's only been an issue recently, which is climate change. Maybe it should have been an issue earlier, but it wasn't quite the issue it is today. And I expect it will be an increasing issue in the future. And, and uh, uh, climate change, to the extent you want to do full 
decarbonization of, in the power sector, that's going to mean not just changing the generation mix, but perhaps even more importantly, for it, certainly the predicate, changing the, the, the transmission system to ensure a transmission system is capable of moving power from these more remote locations, from these renewable resources, the new resources, whether offshore or in other locations, to the load. And, and that's going to naturally then kick the issue over to the states because they're in charge of siting. And the issues aren't easy when you're dealing with siting transmission lines. And the solutions aren't always painless. But at some point, if you want to go with full carbon decarbonization, you're going to have to look at transmission, which means you're going to have to look at building more and different transmission in different locations. And uh, you're going to have to grapple with the the consequences of that, the people complaining to and litigating, frankly, whether there should be a power line here versus there. But I'm not sure I see how you get past some of those issues without, without some pain. There, there may be a better world beyond, but there's, there's a path you have to try, tread to get to that better world. And it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be painless. But we're all in this together, as they say. So I take some solace from that. Yeah, that's a great point to end on. And yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, this is a great conversation. I know it gets um, kind of technical sometimes and I'm glad to uh, host you guys on the webinar. And, and I think Larry had mentioned some of the topics that uh, they had previously covered were a little arcane, but uh, I think it was positive looking for um, uh, working with the Office of Public Participation and getting opportunities like this to kind of engage a little bit more with states. So I'm really happy to, to um, host both of you guys on the webinar today and, um, and then just, yeah, hope to keep having these conversations in the future as well. So thanks so much, both of you, and I uh, uh, hope everyone has a good rest of their days today. And thank you. Thanks very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.